right, uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to the Michigan Ice Climbing Festival. So we do have some major announcements and so bear with me on this. Um, so as you are walking into the auditorium, I can see you probably were shedding a little rain, it's a little wet out there. And we, as the organizers of this event, uh, in uh, cooperation with the Park Service, have had a really interesting day, kind of a roller coaster day, right? And so uh, we successfully got about 235 people in clinics out on the ice in the last two days. Uh, so yeah, we're excited about that. And in those clinics, we have some of the best athletes and guides in the world uh, teaching those for us. And as they came in this, this afternoon, uh, we're like, how is it, how is it? Uh, and all of them are going, it's really bad. Uh, and then uh, Joe and uh, Dave uh, from the Park Service, this, everybody give a hand to Joe Hughes. So, so we have a really, really good relationship with the uh, park through this uh, festival for 30 plus years. We also work together on the uh, High Angle Rescue Team here. And uh, Joe was in contact with us all day. And did anybody climb out at Sandpoint today? Yeah, so uh, Joe's main job is an ice climber. His second job is uh, with the park service. Uh, but, and, and uh, yeah and protecting our natural resources. And if you were out there today, it's just a goat trail and mud going up to all of the uh, climbs. And uh, so we made the decision uh, jointly to, let's just get rid of Sandpoint Road. We'll do the demos out at schoolroom and we can climb in the rest of the park. And uh, once uh, uh, the guidebook author, John Jungheimer came in, I was like, going, hey John, how is it? And he goes, someone will die at this festival, he says, Rocks are falling, pillars are falling, and it's just not worth it. And so, you know, I take that very seriously, and uh, it kills me to do it, but uh, we have to cancel our clinics and the demo. And I know that as disappointing as that is, is how far most of you have driven, uh, we are still gonna do our festival and try the best that we can to give you a quality experience. And uh, that means you'll get your refund uh, for your demo, you'll get the refund for any classes that you were taking Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Scholarships, uh, I, I know there's Sunat scholars here that were supposed to climb this weekend. We are gonna uh, move those back into uh, next year, 2025, where hopefully it will be a lot colder than this. So uh, with that, um, uh, I'll have some more announcements. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joe, and maybe he can offer a little uh, uh, more information on the rest of the park as well. I didn't prepare anything. So uh, off the top of my head, something actually kind of cool is going on that you guys may not realize. If you try to camp at Pictured Rocks any time of the year in the summer, we're full. No one's camping in the park. Which means the whole you got the whole park to yourselves, right? You can hike anywhere. We were out in Chapel this weekend, and the Rangers were running, or yet yeah, today, and the Rangers were running to people. They're like, this is awesome. We can hike anywhere. We can see things we wanted to see. And so. I know it, this is a big bummer, but you know, you guys have the park to yourself and you can go anywhere you want, you know? Um, so uh, on, the, on the, um, the sadder side is the closure. So the park's still gonna, we're still gonna enforce a closure for Sand Point. That whole climbing area, you guys never realize it, but it's a wetland. It's literally a wetland on an angle, right? The whole thing. And so we just wanna make sure we're protecting that. So we're gonna be out enforcing that closure for the weekend, make sure not just you guys, but the, anybody else coming is not getting into that area because we want to just really protect that and um, and we want to keep this festival going for years. And you know, partnering with you guys and protecting the park's resources is, is very important to us. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, we'll be around. I mean, the Rangers are going to be in the park. We're going to be here to chapel all three days, just hiking our butts off, talking to people being out and about. So if you guys see us, say hi, and I'll be around. So yeah, this stinks, but you know, it is kind of cool. You got the whole park to yourself right now. So thanks for coming.
I can't stress enough how disappointing this is, but um, we say that this ice climbing festival isn't just about ice climbing, and it really isn't. So there have been many of you that I've seen for decades here, and just really appreciate you coming out. Um, so our athletes um, are rallying as we speak to develop new ice or off ice clinics. All of those are gonna be free. Um, and so you will see an email tomorrow and then it'll be on social media that um, you can sign up for. So if it's uh, screw sharpening or pick sharpening or we are, uh, the, I should have mentioned the uh, dry tooling clinic with Kevin is still happening. So we're adding, yeah, I know, we're still adding spaces to that. We're trying to open more dry tooling clinics. Uh, uh, what day is your Saturday? So uh, maybe Sunday and offering a couple new areas and, and putting those athletes that were teaching other classes on those. So there'll be a lot going on uh, if you would like to partake in that as well. Um, we are also doing um, all of our socials. Uh, so if you were here back in the early 90s when uh, this one really took off. You're probably going to see Bill, old school Bill at the socials. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so, they may not have enough old Milwaukee in this town for me, but uh, we'll see. We'll, uh, we're going to try to take care of that. Uh, then the photo contest is still happening. So the hashtag is Michigan Ice Fest uh, 2024. Uh, we take the uh, photos and it can be of anything. Every year it's of anything. Uh, we put them on Facebook. The one that gets the most like gets a free registration to next year. The treasure hunt. Is anybody looking for the treasure yet? Couple. Um, so uh, we uh, issued a clue today. We'll issue the rest of the clues uh, tomorrow. And if it's not found, another one on Saturday. And that uh, the prize for finding that is a pair of the new Black Diamond Hydra tools that are being uh, delivered in the fall, okay? Uh, so it's about an $800 prize, um, and it's not in the park, it's in Munising, it's really easy to find, uh, so look at those clues, okay? Uh, a set of vice axes. And uh, that's, I think, it. Um, I, I would really stress um, using extreme caution if you are planning, if you have your own gear and going out, um, that uh, the conditions are really, really sketchy, really, really poor. Uh, we would not cancel the clinics if we didn't think so. So um, you could, there's a lot of locals here that I see that climb here uh, on a weekly basis. And, and if you ask them if they're going out, they're not going out. So just be really, really cautious with that. So um, with that, um, I think we're going to play you a little trailer here and then start this evening's programs. How do I start it? Michigan Ice Fest recognizes the tribal nations of this territory, the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, the Lakeview Desire Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, the Bay Mills Indian community, the Hannaville Indian community, and the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. We acknowledge that we stand upon the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg. Welcome to the Michigan Ice Fest. With title sponsor, Black Diamond Equipment. Live, climb, repeat. Sponsored 
Patagonia. Building the best product, causing no unnecessary harm, using business to protect nature, not bound by convention. The North Face. Tested in labs, proven on expeditions, trusted by athletes. Mountain Hardware. We create performance apparel and equipment to empower outdoor athletes to live boldly. Petzl. Access the inaccessible. Scarpa. Explore innovation and tradition with Scarpa, where a rich legacy meets cutting edge advancements. Whether you ski, climb, hike, or run, Scarpa is committed to ensuring that enthusiasts experience top tier quality in every adventure they pursue. No place too far. Camp USA. Lighter. Faster. Camp. Yeti. Built for the Y. Arcteryx. Arcteryx. For what's to come. La Sportiva. For over 90 years, we've been innovating products that let you go where you dream to go, do what you dream to do, and live how you want to live. La Sportiva. Innovation with passion. Rad. We are the mountain people. We are rad. And Sterling Ropes. Sterling designs and manufactures the highest quality rope and cord for the tallest peaks, toughest climbs, and most remote missions. With support from Gravel. Clean Canteen, Blue Ice, Higher Love, Nerona, Fitz Socks, Osprey Packs, Loa Boots, Good To Go, The Fire Station, Trango, Furnace Industries, Adventure Medical Kits, East Channel Brewing Company, Alpinist Magazine, the Munising Visitor Bureau, Michigan Outdoor Recreation Industry Office, and Munising, Michigan, the home of the festival and your gateway to Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. great big hand to Mike Wilkinson who every year does an amazing job with our trailer and Mike's right over here in the corner has uh, a couple of yeah the ironic thing is uh, he has a, a film called Gone Tomorrow about ice climbing in Kentucky and that's always the statement of yeah it's an amazing film you should watch it that uh, if the ice is in uh, you should climb it today because it'll be gone tomorrow so um, uh, make sure you check that out. And once again, thank you, Mike. Really appreciate that. Um, all of our presentations tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday are live streamed. Uh, so if your mom wants to watch it at home, have her tune in on our YouTube channel. Uh, so it'll be super fun. Um, the one thing I failed to mention is uh, uh, we are known for our raffles. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And uh, so I, I am going to... Uh, put more stuff in the raffle, just there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so tonight's uh, presentation is by La Sportiva, so you don't want to leave early because we're giving away a pair of mountain boots. And, uh, and then uh, Clint's later, he, Clint is sponsored by Gravel. We're gonna uh, raffle off a pair of ice axes too, so all kinds of stuff, so. Uh, so I think we should get the uh, uh, party started, uh, so to speak. And um, Kevin's la our first appearance at Ice Fest was last year. He is a Midwest boy from uh, Wisconsin, uh, so I'm very proud of that. He is one, probably one of the strongest dry toolers in the country right now. Um, he just got off the plane a day ago or two days ago, two days ago from Italy. Uh, and I don't know if you guys uh, uh, follow climbing or not, uh, but it's all over the climbing news that he climbed a 
uh, D, repeated a D16 and confirmed that grade. First American to do that. All right. And, and I don't want to butcher the name, but it's L -T Alethea. There we go. So uh, a big round of applause for Kevin Lindell. All right, how's everyone doing tonight? Oops, sorry, just gonna get the mic in, there we go. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. I'm so excited everyone was able to make it, and you guys are all willing to come and watch a dry tooling presentation. Not often at Ice Fest, but this is perfect conditions, I suppose, for a dry tooling presentation. And hopefully this weekend, we'll be able to figure something out. I know we have some dry tooling events going on. Hopefully we can get more people in, uh, keep the stoke high, and make sure everyone's hanging around and. Uh, dangling on some ice tools. And a big round of applause for um, Bill, all the organizers, uh, the park staff, everyone keeping us safe. I know it's a hard call. Um. <laughs> it's definitely a hard call having to pull these clinics, but they're looking out for everyone's best interest and hopefully all the athletes here can make sure that you guys are getting some skills and making this a su uh, successful weekend. So thank you again for all being here and hanging out. Now tonight, my presentation is gonna be a little different than some other ice climbing ones you've seen in the past. As I mentioned, this is a dry tooling presentation and I've been spending a lot of time in Italy the past few years and it's kind of funky how I ended up there. So I wanna kind of share with you guys my story of how I ended up finding this random cave in Italy to climb at and dedicating about eight years of my life now to going and climbing here. First off, it's always beautiful weather and really nice out there. Um, so it's hard to beat cheap coffee, go to flip, uh, climb with flip flops. And yeah, it's, it's just beautiful. It's like 40 degrees all the time, even in winter. So last week we took flip flops out to the crag and we're hanging on ice tools. So it's a really cool spot. But just wanna share a little bit more of that story with you all. Now, uh, some of you are familiar, there's competition ice climbing going on in the world. And actually a few of us are in here tonight that compete for the USA ice climbing team. Uh, Kendra Stritch is here, Angela Limbox here, and we have one of our youth climbers here, um, Dominic. So it's really cool to have all of them here. Uh, Kendra was honestly one of my mentors when I got into the competition scene. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with her. Uh, she's been coming up to this ice fest for years, so uh, make sure you say hi. And yeah, it's a really fun community. If you guys have ever wanted to get into competition ice climbing, reach out to those guys. They're really making a push in the Midwest here to get it going. There's also a big scene out west and the east coast, so it's a really, really fun sport and I highly recommend it for everyone. Now, my background started out, when I moved from Wisconsin to Colorado, I ended up meeting my mentor, Marcus Garcia. Some of you may be familiar, he's come up here and taught before, but he had a huge impact on our sport. Uh, he was super kind to me and he took me under his wing and he taught me everything I know about climbing and I'm forever grateful for what he's done for us and our sport of ice climbing and mixed climbing. If you have ever taken a clinic with Marcus, I'm sure you all know he's just a fantastic guy, a wealth of knowledge, and he's just stoked on getting people out there climbing. So um, really, really awesome guy and really owe everything to him. And that gets me kind of to my first competition season. When I was starting trying to get into the competition scene, I went to URA, Colorado, and I saw the mixed climbing competition for the first time, and I just had my mind blown. I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? It was so crazy. People were climbing up these hanging logs above the canyon, and I was just blown away. I really wanted to get into this more, and I talked to Marcus about it more, and he was willing to kind of help me out and streamline me into it. So that first year, my goal was to go compete at the Youth World Championships that were taking place in Ravenstein, Italy. Now, where I'm climbing right here in this photo is the structure there, and it's super crazy, really bizarre, um, a lot of fun overhanging climbing. And unfortunately, on our way there, we ended up having our, um, our rules changed, and we ended up being too old to compete by the time we were in flight there. So they entered us into the World Cup, and that was like way over my head at the time. And it was kind of a humbling experience. I think I fell off of hold three, and they don't give you a second chance, you're just kind of done. <laughs> so flew all the way to Italy, got three holds up a route, was like, okay, well, it gave me a good idea and a lot of motivation to get back, uh, learn this sport more, and try to progress in the future. And as the years went on, um, I kept trying to progress in my competition climbing. I got to travel around the world um, with Kendra and Angela. And eventually that led me to the Italian Dolomites. So I ended up meeting another competitor whose name was Tom Ballard, a very famous mountaineer. 
And at the time, he was developing a really, really cool dry tooling, Craig, on the Marmalada. So if you guys can see that upper arrow that says Tomorrow's World on there, that is where one of the most famous dry tooling caves in the world is. It's on one of the biggest mountains that's known as the Queen of the Dolomites um, on the Marmalada there, and it's absolutely crazy. So I decided to go with Tom between competitions and go check out this place. So this is the road that you take, and it's super bizarre. You have to run across a ski trail to get there. So you're kind of playing Frogger as you go along. So it's really, really stressful, and I forgot about it. And last week, I had to play that game again, and my cardio is not what it used to be. So <laughs> the struggle is real not to get run over. Uh, Tom was awesome. He's right there in the front, um, hanging out here. This is young Kevin back in the day. He was kind of showing me the way. This was way above my head. And if you can see on this arrow here, this is the Tomorrow's World Cave, and it's a massive roof. It spans about 50 meters, and Tom developed this entire cave by himself. So he would go up, and he would basically put a bolt in the bottom of the rock. He'd run a rope up and bolt everything on lead. It's outrageous what he did there, um, massive. The biggest line here, which is kind of the crowning jewel of the cave, runs up from this point, goes across the whole thing, and it's called the line above the sky. It's about a 52-meter route, um, primarily spanning all roof climbing. And the rock style here is really, really cool. As you guys can see, it's all this pocketed limestone, which is perfect for ice tools. It's absolute dream to climb in. In the US, this would normally be a pristine rock climbing cave, but uh, most of the Europeans are pretty lazy and they don't want to hike up to this chossy cave that would be a five-star place here. So luckily, we get to enjoy this as dry toolers. Now, you guys can kind of get a better sense of what this cave looks like here. Tom's down here belaying, and this is one of the shorter routes in the roof that comes straight out here. It's massive, and I was not prepared. I think, actually, I made it five moves into my first route and dislocated my shoulder, and I was like, oh, okay, end of the trip. <laughs> it was kind of rough. And this photo here is kind of important if you guys check out. Um, in the back, you can see this guy chilling up here. This will be more relevant later in the story, but he's working on putting up a new route as we speak. Just another view of this cave. It's a massive mountain above, and young Kevin here, I was still stoked even after dislocating my shoulder, but it was absolutely amp just to be here. Beautiful, beautiful place. And Tom was fortunate enough to go and show us some of his other routes that he was putting up at the time. And this ice school blew me away. It's absolutely crazy. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. But Tom's here putting up these crazy routes, and I was like, oh, cool, it's a D9. Like, it was, ended up being like, 40 some meters or something. Hardest D9 of my life. I was like cruxing out super hard, but Tom was just super, super motivated, really kind, wanted to get us up there, and he didn't care how good we are. He, his goal was just to have fun with climbing. Um, absolutely amazing mountaineer in person. And here's Tom, he's working on one of his new routes, kind of showing us and um, kind of sharing his home here in the Dolomites. He was living in Italy at the time, so it was really kind of him. He let me come and stay at his home uh, between there. I just fell in love with this place. Absolutely gorgeous, beautiful farmland. And how cool is it? They have ice like growing in the center of their streets here and you can ski through town. So pretty amazing. I think every town should have this. <laughs> then if you can see here, this is another aspect of the Marmalada I was talking about. And if you guys look at this route down here, I think this is like, it was six or seven pitches. I had never done any multi-pitch mix climbing or ice climbing. And Tom's like, uh, you should be good. We'll, we'll just go run up it really quick. I'm like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. It was all this really crazy bare glass ice going up. You had to pull this roof section in here. Um, and I'm not sure about any of you guys. I've never climbed on pitons before, and I was freaking out. I got to this mix section. This whole roof is on pitons. I was like, oh, my God, like not prepared for it. So um, right after this part, you can kind of see it's like piton anchor, and you go up this crack, and we have backpacks on. I was stressing super hard. And our friends were climbing on this ice route over here to the left, and Tom was such an amazing climber. One of our friends dropped their tool. He wrapped down and free soloed back up the couple pitches in maybe about like 20 minutes, like retrieved the tool, like it was no big deal, and we're just hanging out. So it was just amazing climber. And after this point, I left here and I was like, okay, I'm not quite ready, but I knew this was something I want to climb in the future. I watched Tom, he had just put up this new route called the Line Above the Sky, which was the first D15 in the world. And when I watched him climb it, he just floated across. It was unbelievable. I, yeah, there was just no way I could even touch it. But it really kind of sunk into my head and I was like, okay, one day I want to get back here and climb. And in the meantime, I ended up going and coaching with my mentor, uh, Marcus Garcia, uh, who's right here with some of the youth climbers. And we ended up going to France and helping coach the youth, uh, USA uh, youth team. And we ended up going the next year to Liechtenstein and coaching the same team. 
and it's really, really fun. These climbers now are some of the best in the world and actually just got to compete with them last week. And one of the youngest climbers, uh, Keenan, he uh, was first off the podium, which was huge for the men. And Kat, she ended up being the first American to make it on a lead podium. So it's really cool to see these kids progress. Two silver medals. Yeah, two silver medals and in speed. She absolutely crushed it. So after this, I did a bunch of training and things, um, and I was continuing with my uh, climbing career. And in 2019, I was able to go to Korea, and I had my best competition I ever had. I ended up making finals in lead, which I believe was the first American to do so um, for lead climbing. And I was like, okay, I'm feeling really strong. I'm feeling ready. And it was a really cool atmosphere to be at. This structure in Korea is absolutely massive. It's like 120 feet tall. Um, they have loud music going. Uh, it's, it's really, really fun climbing. Um, and it just had me really amped. I was like, okay, I'm feeling confident in my climbing. And I started to get this idea like, okay, I think I'm ready to go back now and try those routes in Italy. So I started to plot out a plan. And I decided to do my first trip back to the Italian Dolomites. And here we can see, this isn't the top of the Marmolata, this is like a foothill of it. It's an absolutely massive mountain, and you can kind of see the cave down here. So I went with my friend Joe, and instantly stunned again by the scenery. Absolutely beautiful place, and this was Joe's first view of the cave. Absolutely massive. And Tom had done some development, and it's, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to take note of that one photo, there was a guy hanging there, and he started bolting this new route scene that goes across the cave. He ended up proposing this as the first D16 in the world, um, and it was a pretty big deal. No one had repeated it at the time, and it was just like, I think it's 55 meter route, absolutely massive, huge moves in the roof. Um, so it was pretty cool, but a lot of development had been done in the cave since I had first been there with Tom. Now, this is one of the views of one of the routes called Oblivion, and I had nine days, and I was like, oh, okay, well, my plan is I'm gonna just try to crank out everything I can, I wanna climb mine, like get on that at some point. Um, overly confident in myself. And I ended up doing the 13 that I had first tried where I dislocated my shoulder right about here. And I was able to cruise through that pretty quick, so I was really stoked on that. And just to give you guys an idea of what some of those moves look like, um, climbing through here, let's see. Yeah, I think you can see me moving back there. It's these big moves, you do these big swings, huge cuts. Um, really, really fun on these pockets. You really have to trust the tools, but it's like a different kind of uh, sport in itself. Roof climbing for dry tooling is a little bit different. The gear that we use is a little funny. Um, we have to modify it very specifically to work in these conditions. But after being here the first time with Tom, I had a better idea of how to train for these routes. So things were going pretty smoothly at the time. Uh, it ends up being a lot of figure four uh, and nine climbing through these roofs. So basically, we'll spend a lot of time hanging upside down and doing tool intervals to kind of train ourselves to be able to climb in these conditions. Uh, this route here is one of the classics. It's a really cool 13. Um, and I was just kind of hoping to put it down after injuring myself on it years prior. So after finishing Edge of Tomorrow, I was like, oh, okay, well, the next route I want to work on is this route called Oblivion. It's an absolutely beautiful D14. It was kind of the next progression I wanted to do in my climbing. And I spent a lot of time falling. <laughs> so um, there was a hold at the end that I still hate to this day. My tool doesn't fit in it. I always fall out of it. And it's really, really stressful anytime I get there. So I'm sure you guys have overgripped before. I do that every single time I get to this point. And I got really good at catching tools falling out of the air. Um, so yeah, always wear your helmet. <laughs> very, very good idea. And once again, beautiful conditions. And I spent the rest of my week trying to climb this route. And unfortunately, on the very last day before going to the airport, I got to the last hold on the route. I left my tool on a hold. I went to clip a carabiner. And when I reached back, I bumped the tool and it fell and I couldn't reach the finish hold. And I was like, no. So I didn't actually get to finish the route. So um, sadly, I had to leave this route unfinished and go back home uh, to Durango, Colorado at the time. And my plan was, I'm like, OK, it's not a big deal. I'm going to come back next year. And then the Rona hit. And years went by. I drew really detailed maps trying to remember the routes. I would study them so that way when I got back, I just had the beta dialed, like everything down to which grip position, which quick draws I need to skip. I was really, really centered in on going back here. And after four years of having to wait, thinking I'd go back the next summer, I ended up bolting some new routes in Bozeman, Montana, where I ended up moving to, um, just to train for those areas. If you guys want to check out, there's a cool route called uh, Groggy on the Bering Strait. It's a new route I put up in Bozeman, Montana, and it's entertaining. Rock falls off all the time, I fall a lot, so it's a fun video to check out. 
And with this training, we ended up building a little dry twin cave in Bozeman, and it ended up being a really cool community hub for us. We have a lot of people coming and climbing in there. Uh, my friend Katie started training with me, and I got a really good training uh, group together. And we would spend our days at the gym looking uh, crazy, hanging on tools outside. People always gave us really weird looks, um, hanging upside down in there, but it's a really, really fun time. So if you guys ever make it to Bozeman, Montana, check out the mountain project. Super cool dry twin cave. Now, right before going back to Italy, we were planning our third trip here. There was a really unfortunate event. Part of the glacier collapsed up on the Marmolata, ended up killing, I think, 12 people um, from the debris coming down, and they shut down the mountain. And this was like three days before we left for Italy. So it was super unfortunate, obviously, for the lives that were lost here. We were stressing a little bit for our trip, but in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a big deal. We were going to go regardless and climb somewhere else, but they ended up opening the mountain again. So we made it back round three to Italy. And this time we brought a couple extra friends. Um, as you can see, this is not light and fast alpinism. Um, it is very, very uh, craggy um, going out and sport climbing with tools. So we bring all this stuff. Um, the scenery is absolutely beautiful there. If any of you get the chance to go to the Dolomites, uh, it's just magical, really beautiful. And one of my biggest accomplishments on these trips was learning how to make coffee with mocha pots and try to make cappuccinos. I got really, really excited. I learned how to use an egg beater in the milk when I heated it because we had nothing else. And I was getting really good at my foam production. So I just wanted to show everyone because I'm very proud of that. And now back at the cave again. <laughs> so this time my goal was to climb a line above the sky. It was the first route that I saw Tom climb. When I got into the sport of mixed climbing and dry tooling, Epic TV came out with this really cool video kind of showcasing the route, being the hardest route in the world, watching Tom climb it. And it just was like set in my mind. This is a route that one day I want to climb. And back here, that route one more time goes up from down here, climbs across that whole roof and back out. So my first objective was to get on that. And we gave ourselves five weeks. I was like, OK, I don't know how long this is going to take me to climb. I want to give myself time to work on it. And I went to check it out, and my first go, I got really, really close to finishing the route. This was um, at the end here, about 50 meters in, and I was pretty pumped out of my mind, so I'm like shaking out, shaking out, and there's this crux move at the end here. I went for it, and I overgripped super hard, and I, I may have blown it. Um, so we end up, luckily, it's like way up in the air, and you take these big, big falls, as you're about to see. <laughs> so you have to be careful not to get hit by your tools when you fall. And actually, what's even worse is when your tool gets stuck up there, because then you have to jug up the rope, so it's like insult to injury. Or usually we'll try taking, the first step is you take off one of your shoes and you throw it at the tool. You try to knock it down, then you try the second one, then you throw your gloves, then you throw the other tool, then you come down, and then you have to jug back up. So <laughs> almost every time. But this roof is just so magical here. It's really, really cool. This is me at the start of the route, kind of working through it. So I gave it a second try, and on my second try, I still got a big blister, and you can't really climb with that. So that took three days to heal. Um, but then I was able to come back, and luckily on my third go, I was able to finish off a line above the sky. And I was so stoked. I didn't expect it to go that quick. And I decided to make the decision to try to climb the rest of Tom's lines in this cave. And the rest of that week, um, I kind of focused on some of the, the bigger routes. So I was able to climb through French Connection, which is a 15 minus. Um, I jumped on, let's see, Genesee Qua and Oblivion, which was the route that stumped me the last trip. So that was very relieving to finally take that one off the list. And then, let's see here. We started to go a little crazy, though. This was like three weeks into the trip. And my friend Joe here kind of went into caveman mode and started building this really nice platform out there for us to hang out. So we needed a break. <laughs> so we left the cave, and we just drank a lot of coffee. Um, this cart was really cool. All the kids had these things and would like make them really fast and put soda cans in the mufflers so they were loud. Um, really, really fun to see those around. And got to check out some castles in Arco, Italy. And our friend Matteo, who becomes more relevant later in the story here, he invited us to come check out this cool cave called Tana del Orso. And they made this super cool grill, and he loves to grill for people up there. So basically, you get one climb in, then you eat a bunch of bacon, then you can't climb the rest of the day. So it's more or less like a sightseeing trip but absolutely amazing. And after that, was feeling pretty recovered, so I went back, I was able to crank out a couple more climbs, uh, finishing all of the original routes in the cave from that first picture I showed you. And I decided to work on those routes that were put up by a Polish climber a little later on. And the first one I did was called Invocation. It was a very different style, and it was really unsettling for me. It was very big moves, uh, really powerful climbing, more similar to bouldering. And then right before the end of the trip, classic, I like to fall off things right at the end. 
um, I fell off of this other D15 with two moves left to go, and then we had to leave the trip. So like, uh, okay, well, Italy's not a bad place to go back to, but I was very frustrated. And really quick, this was kind of crazy. So Nomics are great. I absolutely love Nomics. My friend took a fall on this tool between quick draws. His rope fell over the pommel, and this was in a hold, and it almost caught his fall. He was about 10 feet out from the last draw, and he took probably a 20-foot whip onto it, and it held till the very, very end. And then the tool exploded, and it shot down like a tomahawk and almost hit him. It was terrifying. It was like one of the crazier things I've seen, but it gave me a lot of confidence in the tool. So it was pretty, pretty amazing. And after this trip, on our last day there, I wanted to go check out that guy Mateo had just put up what was considered to be the new hardest route in the world. It was called Aletheia, and it was in this super dark cave about an hour and a half south. So we went to check it out, and it was crazy. Like, at the back of the cave, you couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. It's a 65-meter roof. The very first move you do is a figure four off the ground. You stand start, get up, and then you don't get a foot on rest for 45 meters. So it's pretty nuts. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, one day I want to try this thing, but it was way over my head again at the time. So. We went back to um, the US, I kind of was training again. My thought was to try that other route that was called Parallel World um, in the Tomorrow's World Cave. And when we got back, I was kind of thinking in my head, I'm like, you know, I want to check out that route again. I just want to go see it. And I went back this past fall to check it out. And I was like, I'm just going to try a couple of the first moves and we'll see how it is. And I was instantly hooked. The moves were crazy. It was like uh, climbing a competition wall. I was just shocked. Um, some of the moves were my max wingspan. It was, it was really crazy. Mateo was kind of showing me around. And if you guys can see, well, you can't see, it's really dark. Way back there, about 20 some meters back is the start of the route. And let's see here. So we got a little video. This is from the start of the, the route back here. You need a headlamp to start because you can't see anything at the start. And as you work your way out, you eventually climb to the light. So it takes a minute for your eyes to adjust. And as the belayer, you actually try not to look out because you can't see any of the rope or where the climber is if you look that way. So you kind of have to like watch the rope from your side. And it's a really bizarre kind of route. This route in the uh, cave that it's in actually has a really cool history. It was made during medieval time. It's a man-made cave. Um, Back then, when they were using these big stone wheels to grind the grain, the stone was really soft, so the rock would break down into the uh, bread that they were making, and it would wear down everyone's teeth. But the rock in this cave was really good, and it wouldn't do that. So it's really cool. Inside here, you can actually see the chisel marks from them uh, cutting out the cave, and now we dry tool in it, so kind of cool. And there's an old castle on top, so it's pretty neat to climb. And as you can see how dark it is back here, um, you're just climbing in pitch black. And when I went on this trip, it was raining for five weeks straight in the fall. So it was dripping everywhere, it was super gnarly. I would bring five shirts to the Craig because the first one would be soaked warming up, second go, like every shirt got soaked, every attempt I would give it. And, um, but it was just such cool movement. I was like, okay, I wanna stay here and try this route. And what you can see here on the video right now, this is the fifth move on the route, it's the first crux. If any of you are familiar with what a stein pull is, where you engage your tool upside down on the rock, you have to do that. However, the head of the tool can't stein. You actually do what's called floating it. So in rock climbing, we would call it an undercling. And you have to, in a flat roof, kind of pull into this. So that's move five of 61 moves in the route. So it was pretty cruxy. And it follows this beautiful arch going through the rock here. You climb limestone and eventually switch to uh, this conglomerate rock that Matteo liked to phrase as the Swiss cheese section. And when I first went there, actually, he's like, let me go check. It's been two years since anyone's been on it. Um, I don't want anyone else to die on the route, so I'll go check it out first, and then I'll let you get on it. Um, it's super crappy rock. Like, the bolts, he's like, yeah, they might hold, they might not. The rock would crumble while you're on it, so it was a little heady at first. And with this route, something else to note is you're so close to the ground, you actually have to change ropes twice while you're on the route. And uh, don't read into this, this isn't UIA approved, but we ended up having to climb on carabiners and on clove hitches, because we needed a way to be able to switch without weighting the rope, because our ascent wouldn't count then. So it's so close to the ground, we would stick clip about halfway through another rope up there with a carabiner, and when you get to it, you'd clip into that next carabiner and ditch your other rope, and then you continue climbing without taking. So while you're resting in a figure four nine, you have to be doing this all one hand, and at the same time, you're getting drips in your eyes and you can't see anything, and you're like, ah. So a little scary. And then you'll see here in a minute, um, let's see. Oh, these are just some cool shots, kind of of the earlier part of the route. 
Let's see here. Oh, this is one of the bigger moves. So this is where the route starts to switch kind of to a conglomerate rock. So if you notice over here, I'm climbing on some limestone, and then this conglomerate cheesy rock that's not very solid here is kind of what we're going to. And you have to do these huge cuts on it. So this is another move that we would call a DTS move, and that means where you have to do it without figure fours and nines. It's a massive span. Like, I have a 6'2 wingspan, and this was pretty reachy for me. Uh, you're going to a blind hold, and you have to do these huge cuts. So you're trying to maintain these big swings, and you're only about 15 feet off the ground, so it's really, really heady being like, okay, I can't fall here because I will die. So um, it was definitely stressful. We actually thought about getting some crash pads for the route. And after about a week of being in here, I ended up finishing the first half of the route, which is its own route uh, called RK, and it's a D15 plus, and this was the hardest route I had climbed at the time. So I was feeling really stoked, and Mateo was amped because no one else had been to the cave to check it out. Uh, it was really fun. He was excited someone else wanted to come hide in the mud in the dark for weeks and weeks. So it was great. We ended up getting a really close friendship from living in this dark place. And after that, I decided to check out the whole entire route known as Aletheia, and this is the new proposed D16. And you can see here, I'm coming through the final section where we had switched onto the third rope, and you climb out here. And this is how close you are. This is actually pretty high up on the route. <laughs> You'll see the choke point that's only about, eh, it's between like eight and 10 feet off the ground. This is one of the higher points, and luckily my belayer was fantastic. And on the crux move here, it was a crack that you have to stein in, and it would pop half the time. So I came up with this beta where you jump to another tool, and you jump back into a figure four, and unfortunately I was tired and blew it here. But um, my belayer saved me many, many times, so I'm very grateful <laughs> for the help. I had a lot of falls like that. And as you can see here, I'm coming up to one of the, or the third rope change. So I'm climbing on one rope right now, and coming here, I have a carabiner, and this is where you attach yourself in for the next one. And once you clip in, you have a second blair. They switch onto it, and it was so bizarre. The route was so close to the ground at this point, you actually have to top rope two quick draws there so you don't hit the deck. If you were to lead it and you were to fall, you would 100% hit the ground. So this was a big head battle for me, and Mateo was being really cool, and he was um, telling me to relax and kind of showing me all the beta, so very grateful for all of his help to get through this route. And on my very last day here, I got to the very, very end of the route, and you can hear some power screams. I was really pumped. <laughs> so once again, being saved, like a soft bounce off the ground. Um, that was six moves from the end of the route. So classic, came to Italy, fell off the project right at the end, and then got to fly home. And this was just killing me inside. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I have to go back and finish this thing. So I decided not to do the US team qualifiers this year and focus on climbing this route. And I got shredded. If you guys can see my pinkies here, that burn, I was on the route for, I think, 37 minutes um, without resting, and it just tore my skin right off my pinkies. I had never had um, blisters like that before, and it took two weeks to grow the skin back. So I was like, Ugh. it was a forced recovery, which is great. We all need rest when we're climbing. So um, after that, I ended up getting on the US team. Luckily, I got a spot to go compete still, and a couple weeks ago, we went to Korea to compete in the World Cup. And it was an awesome time. We got to hang out uh, in the Myeongdong markets. Um, it's really, really cool. I was dieting at this point, so I was kind of sad I didn't get to taste all the fun food. But it was absolutely fun to get to experience that. And this was huge for me. So those kids we were talking about earlier that was helping coach when they were younger, they actually made finals with me. And it was so fantastic to get to climb with them in a competition. Like these little kids that were about like my stomach height uh, now are just like the peak of the sport right now in Prussia. And um, Kat, who's about to come out right here, this was, she's been in finals before, but this was pretty huge. She came in and dominated this competition. Uh, Keenan, who's standing right next to me over here, was one of the younger guys. Um, absolutely dominated as well, came in fourth here, and it was just a good time. I was a little worried I hadn't been training for competition style climbing this year, but the roof climbing uh, proved beneficial because the structure is so overhung but it was just really cool to get to experience this with those same kids that helped coach years ago. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have ever actually watched competition climbing, but it's pretty crazy. It's not your standard kind of swing in, get into our A-frame and move up. They decided to start making us jump around with sharp things on our hands and our feet. So this was part of the finals route from this competition. So here, we have to do these big jumps and dinos across with our crampons. You're trying not to cut your rope. Um, you have a limited time that you have to climb, so you have to move really quickly. Now you can kind of see how overhung this structure is. And these are actually these big hanging ice barrels there that they hoist up. So it's really, really cool climbing. Uh, very bouldery. It's very unique. 
but absolute blast to get to climb. So I was very fortunate, got to go and partake in this competition. And I was feeling pretty good after this. So I was like, okay, I'm going back to Italy and I'm gonna check out the route again. And here's a little video from the back. Luckily, the sun kind of changed now that it's winter. We can see the route dried up a bit. It wasn't soaking wet. Uh, conditions were much better. It was really cold out, which was great. I think it was around 35 to 40 the whole time I was there. And this just gives you a little bit of idea of kind of how big this cave really is. I'm standing at the halfway point between the middle of them right now. And with that being cold, I'm kind of an ironic ice climber. I really don't like being cold. And the finish of this route had a bunch of icicles, kind of like ice takers hanging through it. So I had to knock off those and kind of get the route prepped a little bit, which was something I wasn't expecting. So I had two days here to go check out the route again. And I'd been going over every night memorizing this route. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable on it. And I was going to the Youth World Championships in France to help one of the younger climbers I'm coaching, as well as Dominic, who is here in the audience, who crushed it this past trip. And I just want to get, uh, show you guys this competition structure. How cool is this? So usually people can go climb on it, like they'll um, have competitors come and train on it. But up in the mountains in France, it's absolutely gorgeous. So they farm ice on it. There's dry tooling inside of it. And just another perspective, this was us kind of getting prepped before speed climbing. And the kids have to run up this ice column here that's like W5 ice. And they're doing it in like between 20 and 30 seconds. It's crazy. So if any of you guys were out today, basically imagine running up one of those ice falls and you have 30 seconds to do it. It's kind of like ready, set, go. So very, very talented. And it was fun to get to go support these kids, as well as with uh, Keenan, who was in finals with me. It was kind of a cool uh, full circle moment just because his first world championships or youth world championships was here and we were coaching him and now he was helping me uh, coach there. So it was a really fun experience. And just one more view. This structure is so cool. We need more of these in the US. This would be an absolute blast. After that, um, we had a very successful time there. We wandered back to the warmth in Italy and absolutely beautiful. Like I said, highly recommend. I was drinking a bunch of coffee. It was really killing me. Um, some of my friends were actually a little worried for me. I was dieting pretty hard for this route so I could be a little lighter. And I was constantly sharing stories of different sweets and baked goods I wanna make when I get home to everyone. So I think everyone's story had like 20 some uh, baked, like eat this cookie with marshmallows on top of it and peanut butter cups in it and stuff. So high on the list. And after this, I was pretty shocked. I was able to finish the route Aletheia after two days of being there. Um, the first day that I was there, I fell off on the last move of the route, classic. I left my tool by instant right over here thinking I could go back and get it in this big swing because I was about to fall off. And I sat there for about four minutes trying to swing back and forth and get my tool. I couldn't get it and I fell off trying to retrieve it. So I went to bed early that night, woke up the next day and was able to come back and finish the route. And at the end of this, when we have some question time, I actually have the full video here to show you guys, but I'll be posting that later on. And with the rest of the trip, I was feeling really good. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready to go try that D15 plus the Parallel World one again and see how it goes. So once again, this is that ski run we have to run across and we got to play Frogger. And it was really, really stressful. I was post holing through it and skiers are coming past you and you're like trying not to get sliced. You're like, ah, it was really, really panicky. So highly recommend everyone focus on your cardio. You never know when you're gonna need it. <laughs> and that first day I went out, I checked out the route. Um, and the route that I fell off years ago, like two moves from the finish, War Without End, I was able to finish off on the first day. So I was really, really excited. My fitness was really good. Um, my skin was holding up. I ended up learning that if you super glue mole skin to your fingers, you don't lose as much skin. So I started um, having to put fake skin on so I could climb longer. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're hanging upside down for like 40 minutes plus a day because um, the sanding after is really a mess. But we got these beautiful sunsets. Uh, absolutely gorgeous time here, I was just stoked. And I ended up going up to try Parallel World after that, and it really messed with my head. I was having a really, really hard time with it. There, my picks didn't fit in the holes quite right, and I'd be on something and all of a sudden just get ejected off the route. So I was taking these weird gnarly falls. So it was a really big challenge, but I was able to finish that one as well. Um, so I was stoked. That was presumably the second hardest route in the world at the time. Um, and it, it had been downgraded from a 16 to a 15 plus, so, but it was equivalent with that route Aletheia that I just climbed. And it was really, really exciting. Um, a lot of the companies were really cool. They shared the news. It was the second American ascent of the grade. 
uh, second descent of the grade in the world, and um, there's some other people trying it right now, so I'm curious to hear what other people think. But four, uh, four days ago, right before coming here to Michigan, that guy Mateo took us one more time to that grill cave that was really cool and had me try his new route called Heritage. This route was crazy. It was even bigger moves. It's really short, it's like 30 some meters, uh, but just massive cuts. And it, you're going to blind holds, you do these huge swings out into the air. And I gave it a go. It was pretty heady because basically every other quick draw I went to, the nuts were falling off the bolts. So I'd like get to it, I'd clip, and then I'm like, ah, and I'd have to like really quick tighten the nut by hand and then keep moving. So it was a little scary. I got to go back up there and tighten them next time I'm there. So we ended up bailing. Mateo made us a really nice uh, grilled dinner once again, but I just wanted to show everyone the view. It's absolutely amazing. And the cheese here would rival some of the Wisconsin cheese. He'd basically get us an inch thick patty and would just grill it up, throw some seasoning on it. And it was like a huge cheese curd. Um, it was absolutely amazing. So I was very stoked. And yeah, you just get to overlook town. Um, it was a great trip to Italy. Uh, super stoked with how it panned out. Uh, the climbing was fantastic and it was definitely a new high point in my climbing career. And yeah, my plan is to go back soon. So uh, I've maxed out my time. I can be in Italy, unfortunately, for the next six months. So my plan is I'll be getting married this summer. And then after that, I'm going back to Italy. So <laughs> we'll see. But, uh, thank you, guys. I'm really excited. And um, Matteo actually, since I've been gone, bolted a new finish to that route, Aletheia, that presumably will be the new hardest route in the world. It looks insane. So my goal, once I go back, is to jump on that route called Heritage, and then jump on the new project back in what we've deemed the mud cave uh, after this trip. But um, I'm happy to open up. I'd love to ask anyone if yeah, people have questions. I'm happy to answer anything, uh, whether it's on just dry tooling, uh, what these routes are like. I'm an open book, so let me know. And while that's going, I have the whole clip of my climb, but it's honestly, it's kind of boring to watch 30 minutes of figure four into nine. So I'm just gonna let that run if anyone has any questions, so. Awesome, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So I actually started out rock climbing and competing in rock climbing. And I was doing some ice climbing, I was digging it, but it wasn't really my thing at the time. Like I really wanted to focus on hard rock climbing. Uh, then I injured, I think three pulleys. And I was like, well, can't grab rock anymore. So I was like, oh, I'm just gonna keep my ice season going. So I started dry tooling more, but then I never went back. I was like, oh, I can hang on to the ice tools. And dry tooling honestly is such a cool sport because you know, rock climbing right now, it kind of seems to get really good at it. You gotta start when you're really young, right? Like, you gotta get your tendons strong. It's not necessarily an even playing ground, but dry tooling's awesome. Anyone can get really, really good at it. We're all grabbing the same holds. Um, you just have to put the time into it. It's one of those sports that's half a skill sport, half a strength sport, where rock climbing's a lot more of the strength side. And I love the geometry of it, having to think about how you're trying to use the rock and your tools on it with your crampons, with your picks. Um, so it's really fun for that. And I like that it's a very open sport for everyone to excel at if they dedicate the time. So. Ah, no, I do not. So you guys would all be ashamed if you saw my crampons that I climb in and my tools. It's a joke. They literally look like the end of popsicle sticks. Um, there's some reasons for this. Uh, one, you don't have to buy new gear that often, so it saves you some money. Um, two, the picks actually wear down less from dry tooling if you don't sharpen them. So a lot of times when we're going out, having a kind of a dulled pick is really nice because it actually makes more contact with the rock, giving you uh, more friction. And in some scenarios, you're less likely to skate off. That being said, there are times we do want sharp picks and sharp front points, but most of the time you're okay with popsicle sticks on your front points and on your tools. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so one, mentorship is a really big thing. This is a very difficult sport to get into if you have no one to show you. And that's not being said that you can't learn by doing it, but it definitely helps to have a mentor. That's something that my coach and like I'm hoping to kind of fix. Uh, I'd love to spread this knowledge more. Uh, it's, it's really, really challenging. But I would say the biggest thing is not being discouraged. It's a very scary sport if you haven't done it before. With rock climbing, we have a really good idea of what we're grabbing with our hands. And it lets you know like, oh, okay, this crimp is pretty solid. Like I should be pretty good on it. Where with a tool, you're like, oh, it might hold, might not. And then you might be in the air two seconds later. So learning how to use the tools, learning the grip positions of the tools, how that changes pick angle, how you need to maintain tension on the rock in the correct direction of pull. 
usually keeping your pick perpendicular as well as with your front points. These are all things that are gonna help you excel. Um, unfortunately, there's not a great learning uh, hub at the moment for this information, so hopefully in the future we'll get more stuff out on YouTube, but a lot of us that do this sport, it's a small community, we're open books. I absolutely love talking about this and can talk about it for days. So while you guys are here, if anyone ever wants to come ask me any questions, please feel free and I would love to answer it. Competition climbing is even trickier to get into in this sport. And like I had mentioned before, Angela and Kendra are really making a good push here in the Midwest to get it uh, more accessible for everyone. So definitely take a look on the USA Ice Climbing webpage. They kind of are showing different competitions that are coming up. Uh, they're all local and fun, and we all want to make sure that the sport grows and get everyone involved. And we're, like I said, all open books. We just want to share the knowledge and get people climbing. The competitions are a blast, and it's low pressure. So definitely recommend. Come check one out, even if it's just a watch. But you should partake. It's a good time. And that's the best way to get into the competition scene. All right. Any other questions? Yep. I'm all carry. Don't overgrade it. Ah, okay, we modify our gear quite heavily. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard of this phrase before, but we have these little boots that we climb in that aren't like a traditional mountain boot. It's essentially a TC Pro with a carbon fiber sole. They put a little gator over it that provides no warmth, and then you bolt on a tiny little cramp onto the front. Now, if you guys can see why I'm doing this climb here, the quick draws are actually made up of chain links, and on all of our cramp ends that you guys are climbing out with, they have rakes on them, which are those side points that stick off the side of the crampon. That gives you traction when you're standing on the ice or if you're just standing on the ground. Those are very detrimental when you're dry tooling. The reason for that is one, they get tangled in your rope and you can cut your rope. The second thing is my rakes kept getting caught in the chain links and I'd basically be hanging like in the air, stuck, and if I was to fall, I'd be dangling upside down. So one of the modifications I had to do specifically for this route was cut off all my rakes. So I only had one singular mono point basically on a rock climbing shoe that was stiff. My picks, I also had to file down so they would fit properly on some of the holds. I ended up bending my pick over about 20 degrees and it bent back to like, I don't know, maybe like five degrees over. But I did the whole climb on it like that and it was fine. Uh, but yeah, you have to modify your gear quite heavily to work in different scenarios. And the next week, the cave I was going to, um, the holds, those little limestone pockets were even smaller. So I had to file down my picks to be only about a centimeter in width. So we'll do a lot of changes so it works properly for the correct uh, climb that you're doing. Um, there's a lot of other things we modify. It's a really cool sport. Like we make uh, those shoes out of cycling boots a lot, or cycling shoes. And yeah, come ask me, I'm happy to share. It's like a nice way to get into the sport instead of spending $700 to make a pair of boots. You can do it for about a hundred bucks, so. All right, any other questions? Sorry, I'm kind of behind up here. Yeah. Yes, it's terrifying. Um, it, ironically, I actually take my picks now before I go do outdoor climbs and I actually file them down so they're dull. Uh, so I'm less likely to cut my rope. It is a real hazard. You have to be very cautious of it. For competition climbing, we climb with extremely sharp gear. Our front points are basically little nails um, and our picks are just like little razors. So in the URA competition two years ago, I jumped off when you time out on a route, you have to jump off wherever you are. I jumped off and my pick caught the rope um, when it was weighted and I cut clean through the sheath and went part way into the core. I was like, ah! And like, there's no surviving that drop. <laughs> You're like hundreds of feet up. So I was like kind of panicky lower and I had like green fuzz on my, uh, my pick. So it's very, very scary. It happened to a competitor a couple weeks ago. Um, it happens pretty frequently. So it, rope mitigation is very, very important in this sport and knowing that what you're doing with your feet and keeping an eye on where your picks are, where your front points are, is very, very key for safety. Uh, so always make sure you have a good rope. Um, it's wise to have, for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so it was pretty tricky, and heady, well, one, my Italian's getting better. I can now order all the coffees I want, so I'm really stoked on that. Um, the, the heady part of it, it was a really tough mental game. I kind of had to trick myself into thinking that um, I was really high up in the air because I was so close. I actually hit the ground a few times um, trying the route and luckily I didn't get injured. My blare was really good, but I definitely like tweaked my ankle and my knee one time hitting the ground pretty hard. Um, and that really messes with your head. So I actually started reading a lot of mental um, strengthening books and self-positive talk is 
crucial. It's helped my competition uh, climbing immensely, but always talking positive to yourself, being like, this is really safe, like, my belayer is great, like, they're there to protect me, all these things, like, you gotta, gotta repeat to yourself, and it really does help, and it can change your mentality quite a bit. Um, I always thought it was kind of silly, and I was like, I don't need to do that, like, I'll be fine, but it's huge, and there's a lot of studies going on right now, um, just positive self-talk is huge, so when I was like really, really scared in those scenarios, I'd have my friends be like, you're fine, breathe, relax, like loose grip, it's all good, and that helps a lot, so having a good community around you can really change your perspective there. I actually got my leg tangled in a couple minutes here on the route. I got it, I flipped my leg over into nine, it wrapped around the rope, and then I flipped it over and it did a full wrap around my ankle, and I'm like a couple moves from the end, and I'm like, oh, this is bad. And they were like, just chill, like it's fine. So you're like sitting there trying to like untangle yourself in the rope. And it's pretty common with this style of dry tooling. And like here you can see, like I said, what we're doing isn't the safest. Like I'm on one quick draw right now on one rope, like right off the ground. It's, it's definitely kind of sketchy. So just being able to stay calm and work on your head game is really important. Like I said, self uh, positive talk is huge. I have flashcards and I go through them. I'm like, you know, you practice this, like your knowledge is really good. It's safe, like, you know, all those things. So. Highly recommended for everyone. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. Also in real time. Please. Is there any point in route that this can be beneficial in your career regardless of your weight? Any favorites or anything? Oh, man. Um, I have two favorites. One of my favorites is called Jedi Mind Tricks down in Colorado. It's super cool climb. Uh, you actually down climb in a roof, like a big barrel. So it's really bizarre. You're actually climbing down as you go through it. That one was really, really fun for me. And there is a, a route in Colorado as well that you climb up, ah, I forget the name of it now. It's in the Hall of Justice, but it was really cruxy for me. Like I'd fall a lot and I'd actually like catch chains and be dangling there and stuff. So it was another one of those head games for me. In concrete, that was huge. So that route kind of stands out in my head is one of my favorites. And actually on that note, I actually had a draw fall off. Like you'd hit the deck if this you missed this clip. And when I was lowering off, the whole draw and hanger slid down the rope, the nut fell off of it. And I was like, whew, okay, like glad I didn't fall there. So that thing was a big head game for me. And that was one of my favorite times though, just conquering that and having that feeling um, and relief of not having to do it again, it was really big. <laughs> Cool, any other questions? I'm an open book, feel free. Yeah, yeah. Ah, like I said, it's a sport within itself. There's not many people that do this really weird roof climbing. It's kind of the dark arts of our sport. Um, it's a lot of trial and error. So I ended up making all this training. I always thought I needed to live in the mountains and be somewhere um, where I could actually go do this for real. And I was, it turns out you just need a little woody and yeah, I trained for everything in a little tiny four foot by 12 foot roof in that gym I was talking about. So you don't need to actually be in the mountains or anything. And with that, we basically just spray a bunch of holds all over and we make routes kind of the old school way. We put tape up and we're like, I wonder if this will work and this will work and we'll project it like a boulder. So we'll try all these different techniques to learn. And um, that's honestly the best way to learn this. There's a lot of technique that I'd be happy to share um, later, like I'll have that clinic going on or please come ask me any questions you have at all throughout the weekend. But learning your most basic traverses and how to use figure fours and nines appropriately is the first step from point A to point B in a linear line. From there, you start to learn how to spin and do all these crazy like 180s and 360s. That opens up a whole new world of technique for you. And then you start to learn how to utilize what we refer to as reverse grip, where you actually grab the tool upside down as if you were going to engage into a stein pull. And once you have those techniques uh, dialed in, you can pretty much climb anything in a roof. You just gotta be able to hang on. So it's really, really fun. But I would just recommend if you guys have somewhere that you can jump on a wall, try to throw up some holds and yeah, see what you can do. Play around with the tools, find the limits. It's really, really fun. Uh, two by four chunks make great dry twin holds. If you take a hockey puck and quarter it up, that's like a cheap way. And a quick run to any hardware store is perfect for dry tooling. You can like take door hinges apart and screw those on. You have like these good little accurate pockets, like eye bolts and stuff. So all of those things are amazing. And it's a great way to train on your tools. You just kind of learn what's possible with a nice tool. So, yeah. Uh, you know, our sport's been trying to make the Olympic push for a while and I hope it makes it one day. I think it would be really cool, especially now that rock climbing has made that push. Um, for this sport, I think learning how to do these bigger movements in the roof would be fun. We hit a, I would say it's a weird 
dead point right now in the sport where routes were being graded harder because they were longer. So five meters extra on a roof and they'd be like, oh, it's the next grade up, we're bumping it. And I don't think that was an appropriate way to go. I actually think the grading scale needs to change in the future, uh, more similar to rock climbing with like an A, B, C, D uh, scale. Um, that being said, for the time being, this was really innovative because this started to require us to use not only figure fours and nines, but also use that technique that I uh, was referring to called DTS climbing, where you can't do the move in a figure four nine, it has to be done with feet on. And I think this is the progression of the sport because the movement's harder, um, and that's what makes a climb more difficult. And that's where I'd like to see the sport go in the future. Yeah. It is, ideally it would be <laughs> consistent around the world, but it's not. And I think um, we get issues where a lot of people who climb at a certain crag, they'll make new routes and then they'll grade them harder because that's what it's based off of. They've never climbed anywhere else. Um, so one goal uh, of ours from going all over and climbing is trying to get more accurate grading. It's tough, it's a weird sport. Like it's hard to put a grade. You know, it's like if you climbed a slab 510 versus a roof 510, it's very different. So I think you need to keep grades in there like with a grain of salt but it does vary quite a bit. So like climbing mixed climbs in Colorado is very different style than climbing those in Montana or going out east. And the grades reflect that. Um, some places feel soft compared to your style and vice versa. So I think the more that you can get out, you can better assess that for yourself, but it is not consistent, unfortunately. Um, that being said, I think there is more consistency with lower level grades, which is great. Upper level grades, it's kind of like spray out there. Like it's tough. We're starting to get it more dialed, but it's not very accurate, <laughs> unfortunately. All right. Oh, yep, way back there. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of different ideas. Ice festivals are a great opportunity for everyone to have the chance to get out and ice climb as well as try dry tooling. Unfortunately, as the world's changing, it's getting warmer out there. As we can see, it's raining right now. Dry tooling is a good way to be on our ice tools and kind of prolong our season when the ice isn't available as long as it used to be. Uh, I think trying to spread this knowledge is really crucial. So ideally having a hub for this kind of knowledge out there. Um, that's one goal of the USA Ice Climbing page. Uh, as well as I know the American Alpine Club has tried to put out information. And I think it comes more or less down to mentorship. Uh, it's so important we're losing that focus of mentorship in our sport, especially as it's growing so quickly. And I think it's very wise for people, if you have the capability and the knowledge to share it with others. Doesn't mean you have to, but you know, it really helps everyone be safer out there. And with that, especially our sport, going and trying these different events, like the competition climbing in the US, it's still, we've been behind uh, primarily for years and we're finally catching up around the world, which is cool. But we just need more people involved. And I think a lot of people are very intimidated by it. So making it a friendly community, and that's our goal. Like, none of us are scary or hopefully shouldn't be scary. Uh, we want people to get into it. Uh, we want to share that knowledge with everyone. So just come check out the events and talk with us. It's a good time. And most times, like, I love taking people out. So if any of you guys ever travel to Bozeman, Montana, want to go dink around in the gym or anything, let me know. I love teaching this. Like, my goal is just to get more people into the sport. And yeah, I think, yeah, checking out those events and talking with people is the best way to grow it at the moment, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I know we have another presentation, so I don't want to hold us up to too much, but any other questions before we move on? No? All right. Thank you all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. All right. Another great presentation. And we're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, the bathrooms are on all the sides, and we'll be right back. Uh, with Cl uh, Clint, so.
All right, if we can have everyone make their way back to their seats, we'll roll right into our next presentation. So for those of you that uh, came in after the first presentation started, uh, we did have some major announcements. Uh, a lot of our, or all of our uh, on-ice clinics have been canceled uh, for tomorrow and uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we are currently working on uh, all the off-ice clinics. And so you will all get an email uh, tonight and tomorrow morning with additional clinics as they come in from our athletes. Uh, so make sure you watch that. We'll also post those on uh, social media. Uh, the Park Service has also closed Sandpoint Road uh, due to uh, hazards of uh, ice falling, rock falling, and natural resource protection. Uh, the demo is also canceled. Uh, for those of you, once again, that weren't here for the first presentation, uh, all of your demo fees will be refunded. All of your clinic fees uh, that are not going out will be refunded as well. So uh, really appreciate the understanding for that and the patience as we kind of navigate and adapt to this, um, this festival. So um, a couple announcements. Oh, we also have uh, Carissa from Upward Mobility who is doing a mobility clinic at one o'clock at the, yeah, one o'clock at headquarters and you can sign up at her table which is right next to the information table um, anytime uh, starting. Headquarters does open at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, so right after uh, uh, Clint's presentation, uh, we are doing a, a small raffle uh, just to try to spread it out so we're not here until one o'clock in the morning on Saturday night. Uh, so we are giving out, don't leave right after Clint's presentation, we're giving out set of Gravel ice axes, uh, La Sportiva mountain boots, and uh, a few other things that you might want to stick around for as well. Uh, so um, without further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, uh, Clint Helander. And uh, the great thing about this ice festival is the opportunity to meet climbers from all over the world. And uh, uh, we all traveled very far to get here. Uh, Clint traveled from Alaska. So our, yeah. We're very uh, proud of um, our peaks here in the Upper Peninsula, uh, but Clint actually uh, plays in a lot of those ones that are so famous up in Alaska. So I think you'll be really excited uh, for this presentation. I know there is a warning on the screen, so if we have young ears, uh, we may want to make a decision about that, but I think it'll be very entertaining, very educational. A big round of applause, Gravel-sponsored athlete, uh, Clint, uh, Clint Helander. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time to the Midwest, and especially to Michigan, and I guarantee you it won't be my last. Um, and you know, we have some, some tough conditions to deal with here, and, and that is climbing. Um, as an alpinist, I have, that is just the name of the game, you know? I can't tell you how many times I've flown in, and I've spent 23 days sitting in a tent. And you're like, I spent thousands of dollars to come, and I could have done anything else. But you're like, I'm never coming back. And then as soon as you get out, you're like, well, maybe next year it'll be different. <laughs> so um, yeah, I do. I am going to try and keep this uh, slideshow clean. And I'm not going to say words like fuck, except for right now, except for in my videos, which you'll see why. But except for that, um, no swear words. So if there are any, any young virgin ears in here, I'll try and you know, say earmuffs or something like that. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, two first ascents that I completed in Alaska during the uh, 2022 season. And both of these were long-term dreams. And they didn't just happen. They took years and years, decades of, of working towards to make happen, and they took showing up and failing and getting stuck in bad weather 
and enduring natural phenomenons and avalanches and, and partner bales and all those things. And after all that time, they came together and just became this you know, lasting milestone in my life. So I can't wait to tell you about them. And if you guys have any questions throughout the whole entire time, just yell them out, because I'd rather answer them in the moment when everybody else has context than at the very end. And also, you will not see any figure fours, unlike <laughs> Kevin. I, I can barely put my pants on, so. So the first uh, climb I'm gonna talk about is a peak called Golgotha in the Revelation Mountains of Alaska. And among the world's great mountains, this is not very tall. It's even less than 9,000 feet at 8970. But what an, what an inspiring peak when I saw this thing. And it just was incredible that as of 2013, mountains like this still existed that were unclimbed. And the second uh, route I'm going to talk about is a new route we completed in 2022 on Mount Hunter, a 14,000-foot peak in the central Alaska range, often called the little peak of the big three of <laughs> the Alaska range. So I got my start climbing uh, really in, in college. And when I, I came up to Alaska from Seattle and the outdoors to me was the space between my house and the car. I was not an outdoorsman at all, but I, I got involved in this outdoor club from the University of Anchorage, and the first week they're like, we're gonna go rafting. I'm like, I've never been rafting, and we went rafting. And then the second week we went ice climbing on this glacier. I didn't even know what that was, but it completely changed my life. And this is pretty much how it went for the first, I don't know, decade of climbing. But I didn't just start out with talent. In fact, I was given the least prepared <laughs> on a lot, on a lot of, of expeditions and a lot of weekend trips. And, but you know what? I kept showing up. And every week I would forget one less thing. And every week I would learn how to like finish tying my knot. And before you knew it, I thought I was a climber. And uh, you know, mentorship is something that uh, we always talk about. Kevin talked about it a lot. And um, it is, it's been instrumental in my life. And this person right here, Seth Holden, was my first mentor. Um, when I moved up to Alaska in 2003, at 18, uh, he was like 21. And boy, that just seemed like somebody with so much wisdom, you know? He knew everything. <laughs> and, I mean, this guy knew how to talk to women. He had a full-time job, and he'd already gone and, and climbed in Chamonix, and he'd climbed El Cap, and I mean, that was just like, boom. Like, this guy was like, I, mean, I know a celebrity. And eventually, I worked up the courage, and after a couple of years of, of climbing by myself, I started, I'd been reading a lot of books. Uh, about the history of Alaska climbing, and I kind of realized this whole alpinism thing was something that I was really into. But I barely knew how to climb water ice three, you know? But somehow I was gonna get there and like climb Denali and do all these things. And I invited uh, Seth out, and we just started doing these trips where we would hike out to our mountains and climb these things, and you know, we just had one ice axe, but man, like holding this ice tool, like, you know, 60 centimeter ice tool, we thought we were so cool. But um, I learned a lot from him, and eventually we did our first trip to the Alaska Range, and we tried to climb the Moose's Tooth. And along that time, we'd been reading these books, and we started hearing about this mountain range called the Revelation Mountains. And it was 160 miles away, but it cost like $1,200 to get there. And we found out that since 1967, only about nine parties had ever actually been there. And there were more unclimbed peaks than there were unclimbed, or climbed peaks. So we did our, our first trip there, and we had identified this mountain called Mount Mausolus that we had just picked out from the single uh, paragraph of this whole uh, expedition report from David Roberts, and it called Mount Mausolus this hopeless labyrinth and perhaps the toughest climb in the range. 
and it was still unclimbed as of 2008. So we did a, a lot of trips, even just trying to figure out how to get there. And along the way, we made a lot of mistakes. We also learned a lot. And we even managed to get up a couple of easy peaks. But these incredible big mountains of Alaska, even at 9,000 feet, they, they were just so tough. And it would take years to figure out how to get from one valley to the next. Um, that's the west face of Mount Mazwas. And that was our arching goal. Finally, we got there, but it was too warm, and we couldn't climb. We got about halfway up the face in the dawn, and then these avalanches started coming down. And you know, just like today, out here, it was pretty clear that we shouldn't be climbing, so we came down. <laughs> but wow, what an incredible place. And we did, Seth and I did four trips into that Revelation Mountains, and we ticked off a couple unclimbed peaks, and we had this map that we made, you know, up until even right now. We talked about into the mid-2020s, like, oh, we're going to go and do this and do that. We're going to go to Pakistan. And uh, like far too many of my friends, Seth was taken far too young. And it wasn't from a climbing accident, but it was from a plane crash. And um, little did I know at the time, but I saw the, the wreckage of the plane crash from Anchorage and saw the, the smoke across the bay. And I wouldn't know until the next day that that smoke I saw was him and another friend who had died in this plane crash. And I really felt lost at, at 22 years old. I didn't know how I could climb. I didn't really have a partner anymore. And I certainly didn't have anybody that I had, could count as a mentor. But after a little bit of time, I um, decided that I had to go back and complete that objective of Mount Mausolus. And, and do it in Seth's honor. And we had made this map of, we're gonna climb Mount Mausolus, and then we're gonna climb the hardest peak of them all that we could find in this unclimbed range, Golgotha. And this is that west face of Mausolus with this incredible 2,000 feet of vertical ice halfway up, going right to the summit. Absolutely mind-blowing as a 22-year-old <laughs> finding this unclimbed thing. You're like, how does this even exist up there? So on a late March night in 2011, my partner Scotty Vinchik and I stood on top. And as I cast Seth's ashes to the wind on the summit of this unclimbed peak, Mount Mausolus, we called it the Mausoleum the tomb for the dead. And his ashes, I like to think, remain somewhere out there still. But we looked out at the back, in the background, at all these unclimbed peaks with Mausolus, or with, how do I do this here, with Golgotha being this black shadow. And I said, that is the final objective. That was in 2011, and it would take me another 11 years to climb it and about that many attempts. <laughs> so I came back in 2013 with my great friend Ben Trokey, and we just had bad weather. And you're gonna notice a trend here in this expedition that um, there's gonna be a lot of broken tents, or oh, just tents that go missing, okay? It's gonna be a common thing. So the revelations are known for some of the worst weather in the entire Alaska range. As the pilot says, the revelations blow. A lot of digging out with pots and, and knives and whatever else you can find. So we had tried to climb this very difficult line up the center of the face of Golgotha. And we ended up bailing and going around to the, the easier side in a bad storm. So the line that we've been trying to climb, oops, how do I go back here? Let's see. Goes right up the center of the face up that really, really thin ice line, directly up to the summit. So we got, in bad weather, we got to about right here, and it was just blowing, as you'll see in the next picture. But with a day and a half of food, we decided to continue up, and we ended up making the first ascent of the peak.
So this is where we bailed for obvious reasons. <laughs> so after being in the base of this narrow little coolar gully, whatever you want to call it, I vowed that I would never go back. It was just too dangerous. And this has been, had been the route that Seth and I had vowed to kind of be our crowning achievement of this long, long path in the Revelation Mountains. Um, I came back for many years and, and tried other routes, but eventually I realized like, I have to try this route again. Um, the only thing that scared me more than not trying it was if somebody else actually completed it. So in 2016, I came back with my long-term partner, Andres Marine, who I'm sure many of you know. He's been here numerous times. Who's ever taken a class with Andres? Oh, I guess, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Great guy. I've known, him. He, I've known him for 20 years. He's one of my best, best friends. So we landed at the base. Normally, we'd land on this big, wide glacier. So we land on these planes, right? And normally, these planes are two-person planes. There's a pilot in the front. There's a pilot in the back. It's like the tiniest little plane, smaller than like a Volkswagen bug, weighs about 2,000 pounds. And the whole plane, the whole purpose of the plane is to fly low and fly slow. So it can take off and land. It can land on the stage, almost. I'm not even kidding you. They have like, I think the record's like 14 feet to take off and land. It's incredible. Um, anyway, so we landed right at the base of this, of this face and it's like a fishbowl. It's like landing in this room, and there's no way, if it snows, you're gonna ever get out of there. So we'd been there, and we'd been there numerous times, but we'd never actually landed there. We'd always kind of gone light and camped in there, but now we had all of our stuff, all of our survival gear, and it went from 40 below to 30 above at 5,000 feet in mid-March overnight. And we woke up, and we, were, we knew we were in very, very dire trouble. We started organizing to move our camp, and then we heard a tremendous, tremendous roar. Is our tent gone? Is our tent? Okay, everything got fucking level, dude. We just got hit by an avalanche in camp. Um, all right, dude. We need to fucking move down. Like, what do you, what do you think? Where can we go? God fucking damn it. First, we need to find our in reach ship. Oh, God. Um. Oh, fuck. I don't know, man. I mean, like... Yeah, you should film that, dude. I'm filming it right now. <laughs> um, we were able to run. We got hit by a powder blast. Okay, our kitchen just got ripped to shit. That's our kitchen. Our tent, don't step right here, that's our kitchen. We can like pick up our tent, fucking move like, just as far away as we can get. I gotta find my gloves. My gloves got buried. Our tent might be fucking destroyed too. Yeah, dude. Holy shit. Yeah, our tent's fucking destroyed, dude. Poles. Everything. Oh man, this is super fucked. I gotta, I gotta find some gloves. And then we need to figure out, we need to figure out what the fuck we're gonna do. I I mean, everything's in the tent, but my fucking gloves got wiped out. If you start burying some kitchen essentials, 
We can get the tent dug out too. And then just keep a super watchful eye and let's get the fuck like 500 feet that way. I don't see any parents with children running out, so I assume it's okay. Um, yeah, so brevity, but that was obviously an incredibly serious situation. Um, we'd been filming a time lapse of the snow falling and as we were organizing camp. And at that point in time, I was really into photography, so I was just recording everything. But after that happened, um, we realized like what a predicament we were in. So I took the satellite phone, he took the inReach. We both took a stove, we took food. We, we took whatever we could, and each person kind of had survival gear for themselves just in case. And we kept an eye on each other at all times. And as more and more avalanches started coming down, like I started to really think that we might not make it through the, the day and especially the night because there was just nowhere safe. And um, I started recording these videos as like a diary so somebody would know what happened. There's a lot of swear words now. Everything, everything like that in this whiteout world just scares the fuck out of us. Um, we don't know what it is. Um, so this was our kitchen, which had been completely covered by the avalanche debris. You know, if we would have been in there, I would have been game over. <laughs> well, we still leave no trace. We leave little trace, I guess. Can we live with that? Well. Just whatever we have here, I think we can. I wish that wasn't empty. <laughs> that video but anyways we we ended up surviving there for a week with avalanches that were hitting our our rock and, and just getting pelted by the the blast and the you know the the terminus of, of these big avalanches and we'd stomp a runway for the pilot and it would get covered by avalanches and we were just about to call the Air National Guard with our inReach and press the SOS button when our pilot at the very last minute was able to punch through a hole and rescue us and that same day, um, a Japanese climber by the name of Masatoshi Kuriaki, who was on Mount Hunter in the winter by himself, had to be rescued, and it was all over CNN, and we were like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so we made it out without the, without the, the hype from the, the national media. So the next year we, we camped, we came back, attempt number three. And we came back, and this time we had brought a third person, and we parked our, our plane on the big, wide Revelation Glacier, and where we could drop into that little narrow Misfit Glacier, which you can see right there, just super, super narrow. So we were camped right there, so you could just see how anything, I mean, there was just nowhere to go. It was fish in a barrel, quite literally. And we got a good ways up the face, and then Leon's crampon broke, and we were over halfway up, and in perfect weather, we had to bail. Had to go all the way back to the pass. We're like, okay, well, we know, know how to do it now, we'll come right back. And then, we sat there in camp for the next two weeks in bad weather, while the weather ripped our tent apart, and we had to move into a snow cave for the third time.
Andreas and I came back in uh, 2020, 2019, but the, the weather was so terrible we didn't even try this big giant mountain. Now we've gone on four trips together to try this thing and we haven't summited anything. We're about to give up, but we came back for one more attempt in 2022 and we vowed that this would be the last time would it have been? Who knows? Maybe we would have gone back this year and next year and the year after. But it was a line worth attempting. So now we are finally graced after all of our bad weather and our patience with some great efforts to go climbing. And the weather was just perfect. So it was perfect in the fact that it hadn't snowed for six weeks and it was just not too cold. And now we knew a lot about the route. what I call a jive-ass anchor. Three Navy V-threads equalized. Best we could get. So we had the, you know, the, the best equipment in the world, the like ultralight cams, all the smallest pitons, all the lightest weight ice screws, but eons and eons of avalanches and things coming down have just polished this immaculate granite into just utterly smooth. And it was very rare that you would find really good rock pro. And when it was, it was a, a sight to behold. And the ice, well, kind of like the ice like today, you know? You could put a screw in, but it was probably easier just to push it than to go through and screw it the whole way in. And about the same consistency if you trusted it to hold. But every once in a while, you'd get some like, oh, thank God. <laughs> so we had climbed up high enough in the 2017 attempt to know that somewhere up there was this cave. Now, as an alpinist, you spend a lot of time doing these emergency bivvies or you, you climb all day and you pass all these wonderful flat spots and you're like, man, why couldn't we hit, reach this at like 10 p.m.? And then you end up hanging on some little bivy like this size. Each of you get a butt cheek on one side and you're like, good night, gonna be a fun next day. But finally, year, it just everything was lining up. Years, years and years of things not going our way finally worked out. And I can hardly remember what I had for lunch, but Andres knew exactly where this cave was. And I was on lead, and he's like, I'm like, I don't know where it is. And he goes, kick through that curtain. And I did, and I went into the most incredible bivy cave I've ever seen in my entire life. Dude, it is huge in here. Dude. We are a good ways up Golgotha. We just found this sick cave. Behold! <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, like, good ways out there. Get everybody in here. Way up the glacier. This thing's bigger yeah. than most New York apartments, man. <laughs> Just the ability to take your harness off and, and fully relax your body and your mind on a, on a big, like, stressful mountain like that, it's only happened a couple times. Um, but it, it, it did wonders. Like, to be able to just be, go to sleep and go, nothing can happen to us. We are completely safe. We can live in here for a week. It's incredible. And then the two pass of eyes. Oh, you can Not see them all glistening here. It's crazy. But before we knew it, we had to leave. 
<laughs> and as Andres let out, the rope just slowly fed out. And we'd been higher than this. It was like, man, any moment we could get turned around. And I'm never coming back. But if I do, I know where the cave is. <laughs> like any professional, he steps on the rope there. Don't do that. Boy, and then the climbing just got super real. So we had always identified this crux as being this overhanging chalk stone with this hanging dagger of ice. And we were completely just expecting to climb. So we'd been up to like right here before. So now we're basically reaching our high point. I'm like, man, we could go another 100 feet and get turned around. This is like absolutely overhanging ice and not great snow to get there, just kind of climbing stuff like this. And just what a claustrophobic feeling being in like the bellows of this mountain for you know, a long time. Like the most scary thing is that anything that comes down, just a pinball machine, you're gonna get hit, you know? So that's why it took so long you had to wait for these perfect conditions. So here I am entering the, the crux pitch of the route, um, climbing towards that overhanging dagger and that chalk stone. And I mean, it was terrifying. Poor Andres was just right there. There was nowhere to really hide. So anything I, I knocked down was going to hit him. So I had to climb with extreme caution. But God, lo and behold, I got halfway up that pitch and I broke through this window on new terrain now and found another cave. And so I was able to cheat and bring him up and then break through this window and then climb through a lot of the really difficult stuff on the inside, like really safe, and then make this kind of natural V-thread and then break out and climb through. And then we had broken into the upper mountain. And at this point, Andres led on like a 160 meter simul climbing block where he just took us through that. And we climbed like an hour and a half together, just moving in unison and just feeling like Every foot we get up this thing is more certain, but it definitely doesn't mean we are out of it yet. Uh, this is our second V. Put a little ledge. Here, Moody, morning. Ting, how you doing? I feel it. Yeah. I'm psyched, but tired. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotta get up to get down. Gotta get up to get down. Right. <laughs> now on the upper mountain, we started moving, but man, just some wild, wild snow climbing. Like looking through them there, we had to hack through all this stuff, and gosh, it was just wild. Um, just for time's sake, I'm gonna kind of push through some of these, but. Awesome, dude. That's about as hard as I want to be climbing now. I'm going to put another ice crew in here. Great. Double them up just so I'm uh, protected from any fucking ground fall. Okay, sounds good. Um, Andres loves telling this story where right about here, I had I'd placed this piton and, and he couldn't get it out. He goes, if anyone ever doubts our climb, I can tell them there's a piton at the top of the technical difficulties. <laughs> I couldn't get out. Um, and man, just coming up to the top was super special. In 14 years, and Andres and I had, had dedicated so much time and effort into getting to this moment. He and I, four trips, and, and um, just the ability to come back again and again. And, um, it was immensely special. 
Yeah. <laughs> We're here! <laughs> We're fucking here! <laughs> yeah! Yeah, dude! Yeah, it was just super, super special, of course. Um, you know, for me, thinking back with this vision that started with my, my friend Seth, um, you know, I, I've written about this mountain extensively in numerous magazines like Alpinist and, um, you know, written about Seth. And, and he was the guy that really just turned me into an Alpinist. So to me, like standing on, on this peak with Andres was, you know, kind of my, my final tribute to him. And, my final of 13 trips into the Revelation Mountains uh, so far um, to kind of complete this roadmap of peaks we had. So with that, we down climbed the original route that I'd climbed in 2012 with Ben Trokey, and uh, we just let the ropes fall down, and Andres had dropped his sunglasses on the, like way high up, and we found them at the very bottom, only just a little scratched up. It was unbelievable. I couldn't, they were totally fine. I think he still has them. It should be a Smith advertisement. And then we had to walk back across that narrow glacier, go up a thousand foot pass, and, uh, well. <laughs> to basically summarize our climb to Golgotha. <laughs> And then we came back to camp, and what did we find? It had been blowing like you wouldn't believe, and our tent was gone. <laughs> and you know what the really funny thing is, was it was one of those big dome tents. You know what it was called? The Andres Marine North Face Dome. <laughs> Never to be found. Never found it. Totally gone. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, instead of enjoying whiskey and getting to eat a nice dinner, we got to dig everything out. And we found like only just a little bit of, of the stuff. We got a lot of the, the food and stuff back, but we lost the tent. We only found the shell about three days later. And we had to stay here for a week in terrible weather. With a makeshift little shelter. But eventually we flew out and uh, ended up celebrating. Um, now, we're gonna move on, move forward six weeks and into the central Alaska range to Mount Hunter. Is Graham Zimmerman in the room? No? Okay. Hey, all right, well there's, I first climbed Mount Hunter with uh, Graham and Mark Allen in, gosh, was that 2011? Boy. We thought we were hot shit then, didn't we? <laughs> On the west of Mount Hunter, the 14,000 foot, um, the wife of Denali. So, you know, as being a, you know, someone who is more and more prone to exploration, which really first ascents, you know, that's what has always kind of driven me is just exploring and looking for new ways to, to get up mountains and just experiences with people you really trust in the mountains. Um, that's always been really, really important to me. And on an iconic mountain like Mount Hunter, I always kind of felt like I'd been born a little bit too late, or any line that was unclimbed was just a little bit too futuristic for me. But for years, I'd been looking around and just going, gosh, I wish climate change would hurry up, because that looks like a really neat buttress. <laughs> but it wasn't to be. And then I looked at that thing, I'm like, I don't know. But one of the benefits of living in Alaska, the ability to fly around and get to check out things in different parts of the year. And you know, one day I just spied this buttress. I'm like, well, that looks pretty safe. What about that up there? And after years and years of flying around, finally we convinced ourselves to go give it a try. So now at, at 39, a lot of my partners have either stopped climbing or 
have too many other things to just break off for three, four weeks at a time. So I've gone to recruiting the 25-year-old climbers. <laughs> so this is August Franzen, um, just a, a bone crusher from Valdez, Alaska, who, uh, you know, at 25 is just incredibly mature. He's gone through a lot. Maybe you've um, heard of his stories if you've ever listened to the Fern Line or anything like that. But, you know, he lost the love of his life, Callie, in a climbing accident. And instead of turning away from climbing, he turned into it and really just dove in with the passion to kind of continue to live his life and, and he's really just crushing and I, I was uh, super inspired by the way he dealt with that and he and I have both kind of dealt with a lot of loss of, of climbing friends and um, I figured like after seeing the way that he had handled that that he'd be a really good partner and that we had a lot in common even though we're separated by about 14 years. So. He was instantly psyched, 100% psyched. And now I kind of found myself in some ways taking on the mentorship role, not, not so much in like teaching him how to climb, but teaching him how to climb from the mistakes that I've made over 20 expeditions into the Alaska range. So to get to this new route, we had to go through the Raman Icefall, right? So think like the Kumbu Icefall of Everest in this ever-changing, chaotic landscape of ice, just slowly processing down these steep cliffs, ever-changing, rumbling, moving. If you went there a week later, your path might be covered by massive, massive fall and collapse. So this is from our 2023 attempt, but it shows the the ice fall pretty well that we had to navigate through numerous times. Oops. So we'd just gotten to the uh, end of like the easy part and I said, all right, dude, take me tight here. We're gonna about, about to enter the really crevasse part. And he goes, all right. And I took two more steps with my skis and took a 25 foot fall into a crevasse. And I couldn't believe it when I was okay. But uh, what does any good millennial do? They film it for Instagram, of course. Totally fine. Just fine. Totally nice. <laughs> Fall in a crevasse. <sighs> Luckily, it's warm and August stopped me. But uh, yeah, it was a nice 25 footer down there. So the crazy thing is I had expected that to happen. Maybe not 25 feet, but then I said, all right, August, now keep the rope really tight, because this is probably going to happen again, because we're only at the very beginning of the, of the crevasses. But when I came out, I looked at him, and I was like, dude, are you OK? And he's like, me? Are you OK? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Let's keep going. So we kept on going, and we never even so much as found another crack. We started moving up the ridge, entering this beautiful mixed granite climbing, but what had been told was gonna to be a perfect day ended up being a very stormy little microclimate on the south face of Denali. And after a very full day of climbing and then a very wet night with inches of snow falling, we bailed. But we always knew that we were gonna come back. So in 2022, we came back and we had the plan of going through that ice fall and setting our track through before we were actually going to go on the climb. So as opposed to being committed, we were just going to find the track, wand it, and we came to find out that there were two skiers from Colorado, and they were looking to ski the Raman Kular, and they were also looking to go through. Awesome. So we ended up joining forces with them, and we all forged the path together, just kind of on a, on a day about a week before our climb. And man, that brought a lot of peace of mind. Yeah, boys. It's gonna go. It's gonna go. 
So on uh, the auspicious day of Friday the 13th, <laughs> August and I started our climb when we were presented with a about a week of, of good weather after enduring a long, long portion of bad weather. Look at those mountain shadows over there. You see that? On the glacier, look at the mountain shadows. Yeah, yeah. Epic. Oh, yeah. All right, bivy time. Snuggle time. I believe this is the one, right? I think so. It's gotta be. I think this is where we took those poops last year. Oh, yeah. Maybe they're still here. I'm getting too deep. <laughs> Yeah, that was really cool. Just a perfect, beautiful morning. Looking down the Gehiltna. Little Switzerland over there. Kachatna's way in the background. Fork are just booming. Nice little night on the ledge under the rock here. Slowly making our way up. Finished. So the next morning we were on our way. As you can tell, at this point in Alaska, it doesn't really get dark. All right, back at the start of the route, or at least the technical portion of it. I guess we've already Kind of done several thousand feet of wallowing. Pretty bullshit wallowing. Yeah, deep snow, really deep snow. Sucked worse than Dave Matthews, but uh, now. Sorry to any Dave. We're up Matthews. here. Personal day. day. Great weather forecast. Feeling psyched. <sighs> Finally, the real climbing begins. It's been a ton of burly crap. So, anyways, better get to it. Just hard to take a bad picture, and as we entered this really defining part of the climb, uh, going up the striated part of the face and angling for this ramp. August sending her up there. Nice, dude. Get it. Good work, buddy. Just working through. Now we're kind of entering our high point on day two of the climb and just, man, going for it. And we were just swapping leads. Sometimes we would do these block leads, but uh, we like to just kind of break it up. And, you know, it was just awesome watching August just go in and I was like, man, he's so far ahead of where I was ever at at 25 years old. And I can't wait to see where he takes it if he hopefully makes it to my age, you know? It's just really cool, but feeling like this kinship with somebody substantially younger than you, like, as equals, was pretty awesome. All right. Oh, sweet, sweet, sweet salvation. Boom. Oh, 12 hours of climbing today, and we are above the crux, or what we think is the crux. And, uh, man, a lot of hard climbing. And even better yet, clear skies. And just sick. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna actually sleep. It's protected up above. We're feeling psyched. It's 10 o'clock. PM. We had some, like, scary little clouds come in today, but then they went away, and now it's just perfectly gorgeous. Just what you dream of. If this is your dream. <laughs> so this is at about 2 a.m. when I woke up. Morning of 
the third day. Third day? Day three. I'm gonna push through this because I don't want to keep us too late from the after party, but um, the weather was holding really well, and before we knew it, we were kind of topping out on this feature on our second attempt. And all the wild planes were flying by, and, and I'm wearing my TAT shirt tonight, Talkeetna Air Taxi. And that's because for 20 years, I've flown with our friend Paul Rotter, and he would fly by every day and check on us. And it was really comforting to know that somebody, the eye in the sky, was, was looking for us. And somewhere here, they got Hell a picture yeah. of us. So fucking pumped. <laughs> yeah, dude, what a day. We are high up on the mountain. Stay right there for a second. I'm gonna wanna get some more shots, but. So ultimately, we, we crested over that, um, that west buttress, and then all we had to do was slog up thousands of feet in the wind. <laughs> Just below the south summit, it's probably gusting up 40. We're gonna try and find some kind of a protected zone, maybe in the Burgershon there. And try and tag the central summit tomorrow, north, down the west ridge. So I don't think you can see it, but if you zoom in, there's two little people right there. They took it from a plane, but anyways. So we were working up there towards the south summit where we would camp for the night. And then the next morning, almost in right. eerie comparison, August would put Here, the ashes the of his summit love of Hunter. his life, Callie, on the south summit yeah, of Mount Hunter. My first time to this summit. There's the north summit. We'll be going there soon, hopefully. Oh, man. Freaking did it. I can't believe it. Not over yet, but... <sighs> Completed a new route of Mount Hunter. Wow. Thin air of 14 feet. So we would spend the next eight or so hours traversing over the 13,000 foot plateau, tagging the central summit and the north summit with Denali in the background there. And it hurt a lot. But, you know, with a good partner, um, it made it a lot better. Uh, just joking about how terrible it was and, you know, just offering to, to help in any way possible. And, you know, that's really what a good partner does, is they're always thinking about how they can be selfless and how they can make the team work together, and that was what August was always doing. Like, I always felt like I was gonna try to play catch up, and like, well, how can I help him, you know? Because I felt like he was helping me so much. And uh, after a few minutes on the main summit, we started working down the West Ridge. And then three hours and 10 minutes later, we were off the mountain and approaching our skis at 8,000 feet. All right, flat ground. Now we just have to walk over there about three quarters of a mile, grab our skis, which we debated leaving in the middle of the glacier, but we said, mm, no. But uh, yeah, three hours and 10 minutes down from the summit, down the ramen. Oh, feels so good. So good. Only two more cruxes. The ice fall, and then the slog up Heartbreak Hill. Damn it. We're doing good. Yeah. So after a, a long, long, painful night and 24 hours continuous on the go from the South Summit, we arrived back at base camp at 5 a.m with just enough time for them to tell us that, oh, the, well, the first plane will be here at like 7.30, so you can get out then. So we didn't even get to sleep. We just packed our stuff up and barely even had time to say hello to our friends. 
And uh, a few minutes later, we found ourselves kicking it in Talkeetna, thinking about what an incredible experience it had been. And, you know, as I close tonight, I just want to say that I'm sure a lot of people here are um, new to climbing, and some have probably been climbing for a long time, but the thing I've learned from 20 years is that no matter what you're doing, whether it's you're learning how to top rope or you're training for Everest, um, what really is most important is who you do it with, and it doesn't matter what your goal is. The goal doesn't really mean that much in the end if you did it with an asshole. <laughs> so choose your partners wisely, treat them well, include them in your goals, and I guarantee you, you will always come back with a meaningful experience, whether you almost got buried by an avalanche, rained out of an ice climb, or if you stood on top of your dreams. So um, that's all I have, and thank you for listening. And if you're ever in Anchorage and you want to go need any help, let me know. Um, do a couple questions, and then we'll get to the real reason why you're here. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Um, there are a lot of female climbers, and it's, it's incredible. When I go into the Alaska Range now, you know, it kind of started out, I would see like, whoa, someone's climbing with their girlfriend. That's awesome. They were able to get their girlfriend in. Now I see like all these women teams. Um, I'm, I'm probably not the, the best resource for that, but I know it's out there. I know that probably through the American Alpine Club, through Mountain Project, whatever. They are, they are out there, and I, I know some of those ladies. I can definitely put you in touch. Um, and you don't need men. Just go climbing by yourselves. Um, I would be happy to help. Oh yeah, um, no, the planes, they always think they're flying like right by the mountains, but it might look like it, but they're always like a mile away, but the pilots are always getting complaints like, they were flying right by the mountains, but it's the Alaska factor for you. Do one more question, and then we'll get to the raffle. What's next? Um, well, actually, August and I are going to go climb, well, we're going to go attempt another new route on Mount Hunter this year. And if we go through any ice falls, I'm going to make him go first. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. See you this week. Really good job, man. It was awesome. All right, let's get those raffle tickets out. So. How many were here for Kevin's presentation? Awesome, nice job. He mentioned a, a couple things, and that's you have an opportunity at this festival, and I think it's one of the most important things, and that is getting to know these athletes. They'll be around all weekend long, and they're very approachable and have a lot of knowledge and more than willing to connect with you and answer more of these questions. And I know it's hard to answer everyone's questions, but Find them at the after parties, find them at headquarters, take one of the clinics. And to answer your question also to uh, expand upon that, we have some amazing female athletes here. Uh, Angela's here, Kendra's here, uh, Sarah is flying in with uh, Will uh, pretty soon, Kelsey is here, and I don't want to miss anybody. Who am I missing? So we have a lot of female 
athletes and mountaineers and climbers here, so make sure you connect with them this weekend. So, look at that. First time I ever got a tip. I like it. So, each night uh, that we'll have two presentations tomorrow, two presentations Saturday, you will get new raffle tickets each night. So, we, the smallest raffle is tonight. We gain more on Friday, and then we have a really big one on Saturday. After we're done today, don't throw your tickets on the floor, because I want to go old school, Bill, and go over to a gallery uh, to the after party, so I'm not picking up all these tickets. So um, I'll put the bin on here. You can just dump them right in there or in the trash on the way out. So uh, we have amazing sponsors uh, for this festival. Uh, not only do they send uh, athletes like uh, Kevin and Clint, uh, they send all the demo gear, uh, they send many, uh, sales reps, uh, bring everything into the gearnasium, and then they give us these wonderful prizes. So a lot of support. So we really appreciate everything our sponsors do for us. But uh, uh, we are going with a RAB backpack. So the first winner is 6945576. Now if you've never been to our raffle, you got to yell out or I'm going to reach in really quick. So there's our first winner. Let's go for that rope. So if you were in one of our clinics or at the demo today, uh, Sterling has been our rope sponsor since the beginning of this festival. So uh, they do a nice job hooking us up there. So 6945360. There we go, man. That was the slowest handoff ever. <laughs> we do speed raffles here. So Trango, we have a halo lilac covered helmet. 6945248. Ladies, he's gonna be the most popular guy at the bar tonight with this helmet. We have a Camelback hydration system, 6945685. Camp is another one of our gold level sponsors. We got an ice screw. Six nine four five five three two. No, no, make them walk all the way down. She did a silly thing. She went bouldering right before the festival. Yeah. So don't forget, don't forget, the after party is at Gallery Coffee Company. There's a, a live artist there, Ethan Bott. So we have a Gravel backpack. Gravel's another gold level sponsor. Six nine four five three eight six. We have a Big Agnes camp chair, 
We're gonna save that one for a little bit. So has anybody seen the uh, Carrie Crab? Yeah, is Tim here? What's a carry crab? These are for racking your screws. These were, the concept came from this festival. Okay, super interesting. We have an innovator talk happening tomorrow? Tomorrow, no, or tomorrow morning at Gallery Coffee Company. If you look at the packaging, it's a topo of Munising in Bridalville Falls. So, super cool product. You guys should pick them up. And Tim, don't Six nine four five six four one. We have a huge crew from the Arcteryx stores in Chicago, probably Minneapolis. Arcteryx does such a wonderful job sending Will Gad. Uh, for our feature presentation on Saturday and all this uh, great gear. Uh, the winner of this pack is 6945505. We have some quick draws from camp. Six nine four five five eight one. Somebody from the top's got to win. All right. So, do we do mountain boots or do we do the tools? So this is a coupon code. You can actually order these babies tonight. They'll be at your house by the time you get home. Fine print says, valid on mountain boots only. So no climbing shoes or approach shoes. Mountain boots only. I know, they're like $800 sitting right here. All right, we're going to do mountain boots, but we're going to have Kevin draw it up because I don't want to be responsible for this. So, yeah, La Sportiva sent Kevin, no pressure. So you can try these boots on at the demo to get, or in the headquarters to get your exact size, so. All right, so it looks like six, nine, four, five, six, seven, one is the lucky winner. All right, nice. The upper deck. Is that the same group that was up there uh, last year? Is Clint here? Give me a little more juice. Is Clint here? I'll draw it. Clint uh, Gravel sent Clint, but we will give out these tools. They are North machines. They're carbon. They're lightweight. Gravel's been making gear for over 200 years. They know what they're doing. The winner is six nine four. How much are those cost? <laughs> It's on the other side. Yeah. For one tool. All right, $600 tools. That winner is 694-5319.
Don't throw them on the to don't throw those tickets on the floor. I don't want to pick them up. Oh no, wait a minute. This this gentleman just moved here to Munising from Houston, Texas. And he's an ice climber now. Thank you very much, everyone. Gallery Coffee Company for the after party.